Welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. Today we have on investor and agent, Josh Bouguet. Josh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Josh, to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and our listeners and kind of how you got started in real estate? Um, sure, sure. So uh, I am a full-time active real estate agent. Um, I work with buyers, I work with sellers. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also into the investing side of things, primarily fixing and flipping. Mm -hmm. And uh, next phase, next stage will be to get into the rental side of things, uh, similar to what you guys are doing. Dude, Sweet. well, awesome. Well, we want to kind of first off start you. We have talked a few times about how you got into the business off camera. And uh, I just kind of want to share that story a little bit. You had talked to us that you got started when you were 26. You came out of the restaurant industry. Uh, similar to myself, I, got, I came straight in from restaurant. And so I'm curious, how did you get into the real estate game? And where did you, uh, where was your launching point? Um, so very, very first. So license in 08, but in 2006, October to be exact, is when I uh, took foot, step foot into the real estate side, primarily the mortgage lending side with a local mortgage broker. Uh, I worked, I assisted with the loans, uh, kind of saw how things were done day to day, lead generation, that sort of thing. Um, so that, you know, set the ground for me and uh, really like working with a buyer pre-approval first. So I think that was a good starting point for me to, to see how things start and go. Yeah. Sweet. And then after getting licensed in 08, how did you get introduced to the investment side and start flipping? Sure. So uh, obviously from 08 to 10, there's a two year gap there. Yeah. So I was working my tell off as an agent, primarily working with buyers, helping them find some really good deals. And I took note every deal they got. I've seen how they were doing things, uh, what they were going to do with it. And that really, really opened my mind to like, okay, um, I need to be doing what they're doing. If I'm helping them find these deals and good for them, eventually I want to be in a position where I can also help myself and so I'm seeing these deals all the time. Mm -hmm. um, did my first fix and flip in 2010 and uh, have grown from there, one deal at a time and then uh, grown from there, so, you know, leveraging private money all the way to now. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you started as an agent and working with people as well um, before you got into the investing world. Um, at what point did you start making the transition where you noticed that there's an opportunity to make money as as an agent? I mean, had you only been doing this for a few months when you started seeing that or did it take some time? Uh, in the beginning stages? You yeah, know? from that um, 08 to 2010 kind of time frame. I, I, kind of, I you know, from, t you know, obviously with TV and stuff, I always had that, I always saw that there was opportunity, you know, especially from the HGTV and the fix and flip shows, you know, which mm -hmm. sometimes can leave a few things out, but I yeah. always knew there was opportunity. <laughs> so I, I saw that in, in my head, but I, I felt like I was obviously, was, I wasn't ready at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the ability to do so, or maybe if I had the right contacts, I probably could have been leveraged, but I didn't. So I knew that I was in real estate and we're in a business where if we help people, you know, we can be rewarded. And if we're smart with things and, you know, we can make some moves too. So. I was fortunate enough, like from that eight to ten period, I, I did fairly well as a new agent. I had kept my overhead low, so I was able to go in halves on a flip, and we just took it from there. Wow. Yeah, and that first flip took six months to sell, so it wasn't easy. <laughs> yeah. Can you walk us through your first flip? Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about how that went? Yeah. Where did you find it? Uh, it was an MLS deal. Okay. Nice. Uh, it, it was actually, uh, I don't know if he's around or I'm not sure what he's doing anymore, but he bought it from the trustee sell auction. Uh, put it on the MLS for I'm not sure how much he marked it up and uh, we bought it at the time. It wasn't like a heavy bidding competition. We bought it for 89000 off of Sean Marks, mm -hmm. uh, lead or lead street to be exact. Mm -hmm. uh, 89000 forgot what the rehab was, somewhere probably in the 30s. And listed it for 159 ended up selling for 139 I think uh -huh. paid some closing costs. Mm -hmm. um, it took six months, so I realized in that time period, I can't stop my day job as being an agent. I still uh -huh. need to work as a real estate agent so I can buy more properties or law by one deal is uh, in escrow or you know, trying to sell. <laughs> yeah. Because that wasn't going to work. I wasn't going to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. So, and at the end, you ended up cashing out a little bit of money on yes. that? Yeah. 50 50. And it, it, I was happy. And I was, I'd still be happy. So it was good. It was a successful deal. That's awesome. It took a little longer. Okay. <laughs> and then you you continued, you said you, you realized that you needed to keep your day job. And for some people, yeah. that's not real estate, but for you, it's sales. Yes. Um, how did that work? Um, as far as realizing that I had to keep it? Yeah. Well, I think maybe the lure of the TV and again, seeing the investment investors. So <clears throat> in getting the flip and then, you know, maybe probably not, a little bit in the first one, but as I moved to the second one, I told myself, oh, I'm, I'm an investor now. You know, I, I was wearing it proudly. I'm an investor. I'm an investor. It took my 
foot off the gas as being an agent and helping buyers and sellers because mm -hmm. the investment is the way to go. Uh, I don't have to work as an agent anymore. Well, that didn't really work out as, as I thought it would. Well. So, so I yeah. realized, like, keep your foot on the gas as an agent, keep helping people, keep serving them. That's my day job. Uh, and the investment side of things, as you're working your day job, will, will come about. So mm -hmm. uh, I learned that the hard way. I took my foot off the gas completely, and then I had to realize, like, whoa, you, you need to still operate and do your daily activities. Yeah. Especially if I'm only do was doing one house at a time, it's going to take some time. There's yeah. right. a lot in between then. Right. So that's one thing I would tell people is keep your foot on the gas at all times on whatever you're doing for your daytime job. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I know we were talking a little bit off camera again uh, before this, but it's it's being able to be both an agent and investor is just having like multiple tools in your in your tool belt. Right. Yeah. And be able to um, I think we, we were talking about taking a consultive approach when you're mm -hmm. when you're meeting with sellers. Um, a question I have for you is when you're working with a seller or going on an appointment with a seller, how do you navigate whether or not uh, that the conversation with them, whether or not it'd be better tailored for a listing or maybe better, better tailored to sell to an investor like yourself for a cash offer? Sure, sure. So that's a good question. Um, I rely primarily on how what their motivations are. So I'll ask them, you know, or they may tell me how soon they need to sell the home. Or, you know, why are they selling? Is it a job transfer? Is it something that must be done? Or is it just, hey, I, I want to move to a bigger house if I don't sell? Mm -hmm. So obviously find out the motivation and, and the why. Um, and then also if, if the motivation's there and the why is there, for example, they need to sell this house, they bought a new one, then they don't want a second payment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then I dig into what's the condition of the home? You know, does it, is it something that we could put on the market and sell as is? Meaning, as is meaning, it's it's in a condition where hey, it looks good. A buyer would, mm -hmm. would appeal to the mass buyer appeal, and then I'll assess the condition down from there. And then um, if it fits where the motivation they needed to sell, the condition of the home is hmm, there's going to have to be some touch up to it to yeah. appeal and get a little more money. If those are there, and you know the conversation furthers, um, then I'll you know then I'll either inter introduce like hey, either we do some touch up to the property, it might cost you this much. I, you know, I can facilitate that, you know, obviously with the resources I'd have from flipping, I have some people that can do that for them at X amount of dollars. Or if they're like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that, then like, look, I can probably offer you this amount of money for your home and I'll just have a net sheet in front of them and they can look at, you know, hey, A, option B uh, or option C, which is, you know, do some light repairs and then put on the market basically. Yeah. Right. That answers your question. I'm not yeah. Sure. Okay. Basically putting all options on the table and then stepping back and saying, Hey, what, what's best for you? And then helping them in that direction. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't get to putting all options on the table. It just like, this is, you know, this is going to be a straight sale. This yeah. is what they want. Um, yeah. but if we've come to find out that there's some other needs, then I can do the two to three dimensional approach or what you guys call the consultative approach. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. And so when you go uh, and you have those options, you know, some, some investors don't, but you know, every investor knows an agent, yeah. um, you know, and you're going in this case, just like us, where you can go as both. Um, do you go with any intention or like before you get to the house, are you thinking like, oh, it might be better to do this or that? Or, or how do you handle that before you go to the appointment when you just meet them or, or it's a friend and they say, hey, here's my situation. Can you come out and talk? Um. I'll look at the house because I, you know, before I go out, I'll pre-screen and I'll look at it and I always look at, you know, what's the, the value. And then if I have any idea on the condition of the home, I'll either know like, okay, if, you know, if, it, if we put some work into it, this is how much you would get for it and, and that sort of thing. So I'll at least go out there and know what my opinion of value is on the home, uh -huh. depending on the condition or if we had to recondition the home, how much more it would be. Oh, and okay. then once they, once I, you know, present to them, uh, you know, the listing and what their options are, if they want max amount of dollar and you know it's even at the high range where the highest comp is selling then we'll go from there but again if the motivation and the, the needs are uh more than just you know monetary then i can introduce them some other options and stuff. yeah and i have to be careful because sometimes i don't always go in for like i i don't always want to go and say hey i could buy your house because mm -hmm. then i'm only coming at one approach you know i need to yeah. be able to be you know, like, hey, I have options, you know, which one is going to fit you guys, yeah. basically. So. Yeah, and it's like a very laid back, no pressure kind of a, a pitch, really. You're not pitching, you're giving options. Yes. And that you're giving a lot of value is what you're really doing. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. I mean, I, you know, speaking of the earlier days, I didn't have those options. I only had 
let's sell your home <laughs> and that's it. So I feel definitely like we're, I'm bringing, we're bringing more value to the table. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So then that leads me to another question, mm -hmm. which is like, how do your conversations between a client who does sell to you mm -hmm. versus a client who sells to the market, how do those overlap? I mean, there's gotta be bits and pieces that you find you have the same questions and same solutions for those people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, I think a lot of it comes down to condition. So then it comes down to, okay, well, if I put X amount in, what am I going to get out of it? Right. Yeah. So, and I, I don't always know that off the top mm -hmm. because I have to get some estimates, but I can say, look, ballpark, if we did some cosmetic touches, I feel like you can get this amount and the house has to warrant it. So like, for example, if a recent house that they, the kids drew all over the home with crayons, the carpet was beat up. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a few other stuff. And I was estimating five, seven grand or so. And, you know, if they sold it as is, they'd probably try to beat them up two to three times that cost, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know uh, as far as offer wise, um, in this market, maybe not as, as bad, but they definitely overestimate the cost to cure the home yeah. versus if he did it himself. Um, so in how it overlaps, I think condition wise, um, I, you know, some sellers may have the ability and the budget to just do the fixes and, and want to do it and get the top amount of dollar. Some people may be in a position where uh, I just, you know, want to sell it now or um, it might be more um, expenses to fix the home. Mm -hmm. So it could be more than 10000 or 20000 and they may not have the ability to do so. And yeah. it might not justify making five, 10, 15 more on the sale in 60 yeah. days or so. Yeah. And being able to have these kinds of conversations with sellers, I think we can all agree. I mean, you know, it definitely takes a lot of practice to be able to navigate through all of those objections mm -hmm. and to be able to hit those pain points. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you first started, did you utilize any scripts or do a lot of role playing to be able to get to where you are now where you can have those conversations with sellers? I'm embarrassed to say I didn't, I was winging it basically. I was just kind of going off person, personality, charisma, and just being honest up front, but uh, no, I didn't practice, I didn't role play, and stuff that I should have been doing mm -hmm. that I've implemented now more recently than later, than, really? than, than earlier. So to answer your question, no. And uh, I, I wish I would have done it sooner because it would just me, uh, keep me in the pocket and, be, yeah. and, and keep the dialogue flowing. Because sometimes we get off subject and I won't, I'm not able to find uh, their true motivation and needs because it's not every person or, or seller will give that right away. You know, they don't know me. Yeah. They, they don't trust me. So I need to have good conversations and meaningful ones. And sometimes yeah. not practicing or having dialogue scripts yeah. didn't allow me to do so. It, and you mentioned that you yeah. just recently started incorporating <laughs> some of that. What change yeah. have you seen since after, uh, you know, starting to incorporate that stuff? What um, changes have you seen uh, on the seller end? On the seller end? Um, well, in, in order just to be able to get the appointment, yeah. I've had... Uh, it's it's allowed me to get in front of more sellers. Um, I've had less resistance in getting in touch with them, whether it be mm -hmm. by phone or uh, however any means. Because I feel like uh, you know I, I I know what you know what I, what I my intent is to say to them. I'm not just gonna um, just ramble and, and then just say anything to them. You know they want to know who I am, what my plan is, and I I have that in my head. You know in a in a bullet point sort of speak way. Yeah. So. If that answers, is that yeah, answer well, yeah. the follow up on that is that um, I what a lot of the new guys that I meet mm -hmm. a lot, they're just like how I started. When I started, I felt like, you know, I, you know, not that I thought I was a smooth talker in any way, but mm -hmm. I felt like I knew how to communicate. Okay. And I felt like the script was too robotic or mm -hmm. too, you know, not me. Mm -hmm. um, have you found that following the script has has helped you? Because, I mean, you're a very, very charming guy in person. You're very charismatic, and you're a good talker even before you used scripts. Um, you know, how have you found the the structure? Has, has that helped or has that hurt? What do you think? Yeah, I, it's 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 definitely helped, and I could relate to you where, like, it felt weird uh, saying it and, and, and even practicing it, but then, you know, the more I mastermind and talk to her, like, you got to internalize it. You got to, you know, believe in it, what you're saying. So the more I practiced, the more I internalized it, the more I felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think it just translated to when I was having real conversations with the sellers or, or people in general that it just flowed better. I had better, better quality conversations. Yeah. yeah. So Very was, cool. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, kind of shifting topics a little bit. When you've, the, all the sellers that you've, you've talked to mm. and had conversations with, has there been any main issues or main pain points that have stuck out that you've seen time and time again 
that, hmm. you know, that you've been able to help them navigate through? Um, I've, so I can remember replaying a few situations. Um, I think one of the things is, uh, when I meet with a seller, uh, I always, it's sometimes I, I have to kind of paint a picture for them and, 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 and rewind a little bit and say, look, put yourself in the shoes of a buyer walking into your home. So don't look at this as your home. That's and, interesting. and I just say, you know, I've worked with buyers. So I hear the reactions. I hear their comments. I know, I feel like I know mostly what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And I say, put your shoes in, put yourself in the shoes of their, of them walking into your home. What are they going to see? What are they, what are they going to critique? What are they going to like? So I use that as a way for them to envision it from a buyer's side. So then I can paint the picture of, Hey, you know, maybe instead of painting the whole house, maybe we just touch up the baseboards with a fresh coat of white paint. It's not going to cost you much, but you know, the dogs nicked it up or the kids drew on it, but just those little things will make a difference. And if I just told them that they may not see that, but if I said, walk in as a buyer, imagine that, you know, it, it, it helps. So that's some of the dialogue I've had with them. I've had a lot tougher dialogue, uh, not really condition wise, but, um, obviously sometimes pricing is an issue. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes there's specific needs that a seller wants. Like, um, you know, I've had to, sh- I've had to be at every showing every time in the summer and they didn't want the AC on. So that was a little tough. Yeah. Um, we ended up selling, we got past that. So that was some, some tough stuff, but yeah, I think it's, uh, having patience and just, uh, we come from where every day we're talking this language, we're talking real estate. So I think sometimes it's like, put yourself in the shoes of the seller, have the seller put their, their self in the shoes of the buyer, you know, just kind of taking that role and looking at it from a different perspective. Is yeah. What I found. Um, yeah. Now when you go on like an appointment you do find out that it's going to be an investment of some sort, yeah. right? And you start coming to that conclusion and, and you realize, okay, like here's what I can do. And, and you start having that conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you, what have you seen um, sellers are looking for when you are able to provide value and it makes sense for them to go with your offer? What are those situations? What do they look like and how do they feel? Um, a lot of times I would say they're absentee sellers. So it's usually like a, either the house is vacant, someone just moved out or they just moved out or um, it, there's a renter in there. Uh-huh. Um, speaking from personal experience, yeah. um, probably a little further away. So something they haven't seen in a while. So I provide the convenience of going to the home, evaluating it, speaking with a tenant um, and those sort of things. So they're from a distance. I'm kind of like being there, you know, I'm, I'm investigating preliminary for them. And then I go back to them, send them the pictures, let them know what they got, what, what they have, if they haven't seen it in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, from there, I'll, they can kind of assess, okay, where then they'll usually ask me, you know what, okay, what's it worth? What could I sell it for? And again, I get in that conversation. Well, if you put X amount of dollars in, this is what you can get. Um, if, if I were to make you an offer, this is what I could offer you. And I'll tell them, like, I'm aiming to sell it for this, this price, but understand I'm going to be putting a lot more into it than what maybe you may want to put into it. Or, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to take on a little bit more risk that I'm doing this, mm-hmm. but I'm willing to do so. And this is the price. So uh, being transparent, letting them know. And if they ask me what I sell for, I always tell them. So a lot of times I'm just telling them up front, this is what I'll sell it for. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, I've recently I've told them what I sell it for and ends up selling for more. Um, but they can see the listing price, you know, yeah. and, and this market, it got pushed up higher than yeah. it should. Well, that's uh, funny. You've brought yeah. up transparency three times. Okay. Can you talk know. about that? Because one of the, it, it's very important. I, I think yeah. Kate and I want to stress this to people because mm-hmm. people listening, there can be the temptation to not say what you're doing or mm-hmm. to be shady. And mm-hmm. we know people in the business that do that. You're one of the people that we wanted to bring on here because you also are very open about what you do. Can you talk a little bit about the transparency side? Why is that? When did you find out that's important? Why is it important? Sure. Um, as far as why, I mean, I think it's just important in general. I mean, I think it's, you know, everyone says Fresno is a small town and, you know, you want to, you know, you don't want to be have a bad name, but just in general, I think you want to operate from a long-term vision, right? So if I do a bad deal or do a bad job with the intent of doing so, probably not going to last that long in the business or not going to want to, people mm-hmm. are not going to want to deal with me. So that for one, you know, long-term and I, I want to be in this business for a while and I want to be doing this because I enjoy this and I don't want to have a bad name and you can't please everyone. You know, sometimes yeah. uh, things <laughs> just go south for whatever reason, but as long as the intent's there and you're upfront about it, I think you'll be all right. Um, mm-hmm forgot what was the rest of the question. No, the, well, the question is like, when did you figure that out? Cause you have, oh, yeah. for me, 
I find that sellers actually want to know the truth and they don't care how much you make Mm -hmm. because they're making their decision on their situation. Right. Have you found that you actually are getting better responses from sellers and repeat business? I mean, how is it, how is that transparency even come about for you? Uh, And you mean on like the investment side of things? Well, any side, because you come with that consultative approach. Right, right. Um, I think, I don't think, I, I think it's just giving them options is what's helped. I don't, I find like, some, they're not really too concerned on what I'm gonna make um, necessarily because they know that's my business. They, you know, a lot of the sellers I meet either somehow they know like, oh, well, you flip houses. They look at it more like I have access to you know other resources that could probably help them, or they may want to flip a house later. Mm-hmm. So they are, aren't really concerned on what I may make. I think it's just they're concerned about me make giving them a fair fair offer, a fair deal, and um, you know, and them how do they figure out if it's a fair deal? I think they rely on me a little bit. I'm like. Look, you know, and, I, I'm, and it's again, it's just showing them the scale, the range of homes that have sold. Where does your home fall in the condition? Where your home is condition-wise, is where, where it will fall on the scale of from bottom to high. Does it fall in the middle? Does it fall in the upper? And I think if it's explained correctly, or at least you know thoroughly, they'll understand. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and then obviously, it has to meet their motivation or their why. Yeah. Why yeah. are they selling? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I just. I don't know. I, I, I like to operate, be upfront, and uh, you know I've dealt with people who haven't been upfront with me. But mm-hmm. I feel like you know it's you spot it out, and you, you know it's one of those things that you can see, and it's like, okay, do I really want to get involved with this and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, and you've mentioned a couple times that it can be a challenging conversation mm-hmm. to have with sellers about you know maybe something like price. Yeah. Um, is there a conversation that you've had with a seller, or maybe? Um, like a moment in time that sticks out to you as being the most challenging conversation that you've had, or is there a situation that sticks out for you? Um, you know what I, you know, I've been fortunate. I mean, I've obviously there's been objections on pricing the home and stuff like that. Nothing. I mean, I've, there's been times where there was a price that was wanted where I felt like I wouldn't be doing, um, my best job of, of listing the home. So I've had to not take the listing and it's still hard for me to do so, but I had to do that. Um, but if I think back, it was when I first got into the loan business and, uh, we were working with for sale by owners and, um, that was how we were generating leads. And I met this one seller not too far from the office and I told him up front, I said, you probably aren't going to get that price. And he told me, well, you've already lost because you already in your head admitted defeat that you can't get the price. And I was like, whoa, whoa, but I'm just, I felt like I was just being realistic. You're not going to get that price. And you know, he, I said, I hear you're defeated. You've admitted defeat. So I was kind of caught off guard and being new, I was like, wow, you know, but it toughened me up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they ended up selling for less down the road and listed and stuff. But, Funny how that works. Yeah. Out. <laughs> yeah. But I respect it. Everyone, you know, yeah. they, people want what they want. Yeah. And if they, if it takes more time or if they don't get it, at least they tried. Right. So, yeah. 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 And so then, well, the, the, the question is, you said you were new there and when you were new, yeah. you mentioned you didn't have scripts. Uh, now you're what a decade into the business you've got a coach you've Mm -hmm. got the right sources around you the right people you're scripting and whatnot how would you have handled that conversation now maybe um that's a great question i don't i want to put you on the spot but like say say you were to tell me my price was too high or you were to say hey look this is realistically where it goes and i say you've already admitted defeat maybe what are some kind of things that you might say back to that that's a great question because i've i've had the same thing i'm just curious on what you would do yeah um First, I, I, I would have some, at least some, uh, some data to back that up. And I would, I would go back. I wouldn't try to challenge him and be like, well, this is why I'm right. I think I'd rely on the data and the facts, right? Mm-hmm. So usually I'll have either uh, my iPad or my booklet. And uh-huh. I'll just go back to the data. I'm like, look, this, this is what the homes are selling for. Um, this is what I feel like you can get for your home. I, and, you know, let's compare it. Let's see. I can only go off uh, what the comparable sales are. I can't make the price up or, or I can't dictate uh, you know, your price, the market will dictate the price basically. And right. Just only rely on the data. Um, as far as re- rebuttal wise or, or objection wise, that's a tough one. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I probably yeah. still, I don't, I don't know. Old me would have tried to battle him and challenge him like, no, you're wrong. I think I would just rely on the data and let the facts speak for itself yeah. and, and, and be able to present it in a, uh, a clean and, uh, you know, a communicative way to the, to the seller. And if they didn't understand from that point, I don't know what I could tell them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One like, of the, that's a great question, man. Well, <laughs> the reason why I ask is because I, I, we have it on a daily basis almost. Yeah. I, and I bet in this market you have it too. And mm-hmm. in this market, I tell people, I don't know what your home's going to sell mm-hmm. for. 
But in, in a common market or, or a more even market, I'll just straight up tell them, I'll say, hey, you know, if I could sell your house for, say the house was 400, mm-hmm. if I could sell a house for 400, I would love to. Yeah. But what I'm seeing is this, you know, can you help me see what you're seeing? Why, why is your house up here? And, mm-hmm. and that way I can show it to a buyer. And often then I've seen them kind of, um, because they see me wanting to be part of that and wanting to help them. Mm-hmm. On the investment side though, I'm curious because when somebody comes to you and they say like, you know, my house is worth 120, I'm not taking a dollar mm-hmm. less, mm-hmm. but you know your numbers have to be at, you know, 100. Maybe what's some of the stuff that you've used then when you talk with a seller? Um, Cause that, you also bring up data, right? But it's yeah. not like the same where you can show the recent sales on the MLS, what are maybe, you know, say the house is worth some more fixed up, but we're just trying to figure out how can we put a deal together here so that the seller sees 100 is really your best number. Right. Um, I think it's, you know, uh, is it because they have another, uh, is it because you have another offer at 120? No. Yeah. It, then uh, if they don't, great. If they do, I'd, I'd have to say, you know, hey, you probably go with that offer, right? Take the 120. Transparency. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and if they're, if they're bluffing me, which it's fine. And they, then, then I know, okay, then we have some room to work. Let's, let's get real. Right. Um, so then I, I'd really have to, you know, hit, hit again, hit the motivation. Like, look, I can provide you, you know, speed in closing, like as is, I can clear whatever issues with the property. Don't worry about that. The convenience is what I bring. Uh, the transparency and, and the reputation to be able to close on time is mm-hmm. what I can bring basically. And yeah, I mean, if they're not in agreement with the numbers, I don't really feel like I can change their mind. But what I can do is, you know, ease their mind and bring you convenience, bring you what you really want is to sell this house. You know, and yeah. if there's an offer slightly higher and it's like 120 and it's and I'm at 100. If, you know, if, if the numbers justify a little bit more then you know, well, let's let's OK, let's get to that number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that like, no, is it that does. Question? And it's kind of funny because you brought up in both scenarios. Mm-hmm. You said that at the end of the day, like you're not going to try to convince them to sell yeah. for something that they aren't going to do. Yeah. You kind of just tell them what the truth is and then you let it go. Have you found that that's been easier or better or more successful than trying to pressure them? I mean, um, I mean, it's gone both ways. You know, I've, there's I probably missed uh, I probably missed out on more deals than I bought recently. Um, but I, some of it is passed on because of my own personal sta- higher, you know, my standards and, you know, raising my standards. Um, but yeah, it's, it's caused me to lose a few deals, but sometimes, you know, they won't make a decision on the spot, a seller, like for a fixer, you know, they may need some time to think it over. They may yeah. want to compare me to whoever else they talk to. Right. And if, if I did my best and, and, and I, you know, presented everything as, as clear and concise as possible, I may have won, you know, they may call me Hey, I liked what you had to say, or I liked our conversation, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, pressure, you know, I, I wouldn't say pressure, but sometimes I, you do have to ask the questions to make them think and really, you know, get out of this is my house and out of the thinking of this is my house and this is what I want for it. You know, sometimes you have to ask those questions, which I think instead of, I wouldn't say pressure and I know I'm not saying you do, No. That, but I, right. I think just, you know, digging deep with them and like, it's like me telling, having a seller visualize in the shoes of a buyer, mm-hmm. look, you know, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, you know, you know, Think about what I can offer you when I'm bringing to you. You know, I'm gonna buy it directly. I don't plan on doing anything else. You know, the contract doesn't say assignee or anything like that. Nothing against that, but I'm just. My point is, I'm gonna buy the house directly. I'm gonna perform, and you know, this is. Uh, I'm ready to go, mm-hmm. you know, basically. After yeah. I hit the, you know, ask them their emotional um, needs on, in, you know, their their why. Yeah, yeah. And what are you doing now to? kind of continuously improve the way that you're speaking to sellers and, you know, being able to communicate to them, um, you know, how you can help them. What, what are maybe some daily activities or things you're working on in order to better yourself in those conversations that you have? Yeah, no. Um, one thing I, I do, um, probably at least five, five days out of the week should be seven, but, uh, is I journal. So, I have a journal that I write in. It was given to me by my broker or when I started coaching. Um, there's starts off with uh, three, write down uh, three things, three things uh, that you're, that you're grateful for. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, there's a section that um, five things that made you happy. Um, the last 24 hours, excuse me, three things that made you happy in the last 24 hours. Um, left section is I earn. Um, so basically it's not, it's basically I earn X amount within it. So basically whatever I, you made in the last year or the last quarter, 
you multiply that by three and I write that out and I say it out loud. You say, do it 20 times. And then, then the fourth is the affirmation. So, you know, I easily and effortlessly attract um, well, you know, well margin fixer, fixer upper deals or potential rentals. So I'm writing that out. I'm saying it and I'm speaking to my mind. So that's helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is the script play, the role play yeah. definitely mm-hmm. helped me. Um, How long have you been doing that? You said 2018? Uh, yes. Is when you really got yeah. back into scripting and, and dug deep. Even I've like I've had scripts in front of me prior to that, but I never really um, practiced them and read them and repeated them. And so 2018, uh-huh. when I joined coaching, um, there you know the scripts were there. They emphasized that. So I really that's when I really you know in, took them in and really you know practiced and actually used them. Right. Yeah. So that's helped me a lot too. In addition to journaling and just trying to keep a positive mindset and, and be positive about things and and networking and just talking with other people like you guys, you know, before I would come from more admittedly so is, uh, and this is me being transparent, more of a scarcity mindset, like, well, I don't want to talk to so-and-so, or I don't want to share this deal because I don't want to tell them what I'm doing. You know, like you guys sharing me about your, uh, your, uh, your deals in South Bend and Indiana, mm-hmm. you know, that's great. Cause you, you're turning me on to like, wow, there's some opportunity that I didn't even know about mm-hmm. you know, or as me prior before I've been like, well, no, these are my deals. I don't want to tell anyone. So, growing in that mindset and coming from abundance as opposed to scarcity has really allowed me to open up and, uh, you know, see things from a different perspective. And I just feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, man, when, when you start thinking in a different way and positively, just things start coming and manifesting, of course, put in the work, but, yeah. um, yeah, just positive side and, and coming from abundance. So should I say? Yeah. So that's awesome. I mean, I, I wasn't in the business when you had the scarcity mindset mm-hmm. from all I can tell mm-hmm. every time I've met with you I mean you and I have gotten coffee and we, we've met before and I mean you've always come from a place from what I've seen as somebody willing to give give mm-hmm. give and I've never that. seen you take and so even right now we when we hit you up mm-hmm. to this podcast you the first thing you said was yes you know you're, yeah. you were ready to go and yeah. you're ready to tell people exactly what you're doing mm-hmm. to get yeah. real estate deals and yeah. I think that's really awesome that you even bring up the abundance mindset because mm. that's such an important part to our podcast is cool. that we only bring people on that have that exactly what you're saying transparency abundance mindset ready to just tell sellers tell other people mm. and and good things come to those who do that absolutely i agree man and i i was just happy to to meet with you guys and talk more and you know just uh, learn from you guys and mastermind so i love it it's awesome yeah. awesome well any any uh final thoughts or um kind of last minute things you, you may want some of our listeners to know? Um, you know, I, I, I think we, we hit a lot of points here. Yeah. But um, I think if anything, I, I, I feed off of what you guys are doing, man. Like you guys are, are, are doing it. You guys are, are getting the rentals. You guys are work. You've got your foot on the gas as the agency. Uh, I like your team and your team members, man. So I applaud you guys for what you're doing, man. And for me to be here and, and talk and, and, and conversate, I... I enjoy it, so I would encourage anyone to do the same and like what we're doing right here. Have the conversations, reach out to people, and and just be open minded about everything. You know? Yeah, awesome. Well, I know we're gonna have people reaching out wanting to yeah. talk with you. I mean, everybody that we talk to uh-huh. says they want to know if it's worth being an agent when they're an investor. <laughs> What's a good way for us to reach out or have uh, you know listeners of the podcast who have what like minded you know want to be abundance mindset, want to be transparent? How can they reach out to you and learn a little bit from you? Um, Social media, um, by far, probably the quickest, easiest way, J- Josh Bouguet on Facebook or uh, Instagram, Josh Bouguet Real Estate. So, yeah, or you could probably find my phone number anywhere because we're in real estate. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Awesome. Very well, nice. Well, Josh, thanks so much for coming on uh, today's episode. I know Scott and I, we were super pumped yeah. um, and excited that you were willing to come on. So thank you again. I know all of our appreciate listeners it. appreciate it, and we definitely Absolutely. appreciate it. Cool. So thanks, Josh. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Cool.